Chapter 7 The deeper we traveled into the old city, the softer and sadder sang the breezes. Gamelpar kept up with us well enough, but Venever and I were more eager than ever to leave these ruins behind. Ghosts within are one thing, ghosts without another. Down one long straight lane, wider than any of the others, we debouched onto a wide circle, marked off by flat platforms and stone walls barely higher than my waist. From the walls poked the remains of broken-down sheds with gaping fronts. Market? I asked Gamelpar. He nodded. Been here many times, he said. Happy times. He looked fondly at Venevra, who rubbed her nose and looked suspiciously around the broad circle. My daughter had stalls here and there. He pointed out the spaces. We sold fruit and skins and ceremonial fruits, whatever we could gather or grow or make. We had no idea how happy we were. We kept walking. A sudden gust brought with it flurries of dust that spun up and over the flat platforms, rustling shreds of woven mats. I shielded my eyes as the flurries passed, and then on the opposite side of the circle saw that we had come upon something different and unexpected. Half blinded by grit, I bumped against the girl, who under ordinary circumstances would have delivered me a wallop, but now she just stood her ground. I wiped dust from my eyes and looked over a platform of forerunner metal, about fifty meters wide and shoulder high. It supported a great, egg-shaped structure as high as the platform was wide. This central egg, the color of beaten copper, laced through with swirls of dusky sunset sky, was incised all around by smooth, vertical grooves spaced an arm span apart. A boat? Venevra asked. Gamelpar shook his head, as puzzled as we were. Never saw it before, but it's been here a long time, he said. Look, the shops were built around it. Venevra squatted, picked up a pebble, and threw it at the egg. The pebble bounced off without making a sound. The lady has eyes everywhere, Gamelpar said. We never know when she is watching. Hidden? Camouflaged? I said. Why? If she sees our plight, why doesn't she protect us? The old man asked. He worked his jaw. We should find water. There used to be good wells. He hobbled off on his stick. Venever and I chose to study the tall, sunset golden egg for a while longer. The old spirit was shaping a vague explanation. From here, she can reach out and touch all the newborns. I resented his swifter analysis, but could not deny it. Unseen, central, like a lighted tower, a beacon, I told Venevra. Huh, maybe this is where the lady sends out her voice to touch your people. Maybe, she said, with only the barest scowl. Does it still send out messages? The children stop being born, I said. Right? No more children? Maybe no more messages. Then I had a discouraging thought. Is this where you're supposed to go when you don't feel safe? No, she responded quickly. That's over there. She pointed in the same direction as before, arms steady. Gamelpar called out that he had found a little water left in a well. We walked around the forerunner beacon, or whatever it was, and joined him at the lip of a circular wall made of bricks and stones. He had pulled up a wooden bucket on a decaying length of rope and offered us a drink of muddy, brown water. Probably old rain. All there is, he said. We drank, despite the smell. On air to Tyrene, I thought. The water would probably be filled with wrigglers, but here, in the city, nothing wriggled that I could see. Even the mosquitoes had abandoned this place. We walked on. Venevra led us down another winding lane. All the lanes looked alike to me. Many of the buildings had fallen in, revealing sad little rooms filled with drifting leaves. Once these places had held real people, real families. There had been communities all across the halo, I suspected, filled with people, touched by the life-shaper, the lady. 
they had been allowed to be completely human, to find their own strengths, succumb to their natural weaknesses, to fight their wars, humans allowed to be human. Left like a garden to grow wild, just to see what new flowers might sprout up. But were we always observed by the life shaper herself, or her cadres? And had she watched over us, them, through the successive times of brightness, darkness, new skies, new suns? Had she watched when years ago the wheel had been taken to Shurum Hakor to unleash that bitter brilliance that burned the soul? Had she herself offered refuge to the captive, the primordial? My old spirit expressed skepticism at that. If the primordial were allowed to rule and control this place, it would conduct its own experiments, the Lord of Admirals suggested. What sort of experiments? I asked. What the old man has seen. The shaping sickness. It is the captive's great passion. But the old spirit could not convey things too far beyond what my mind had already experienced. I would not comprehend until I myself had seen more. We found another straight road. At its end, we saw a larger gate, opening to the plain beyond. Venevra chose that direction, to my relief. We helped Gamalpar along. Just a few hundred meters from the gate and the boundaries of the city, as the wheel's shade again slipped over us and a fine rain drizzled down, we took refuge in a tumble-down home that still had part of a roof. That night, Gamalpar tossed and turned. No doubt because of the aches and pains of age, but he also cried aloud, calling names, so many names, until he jerked upright. Venevra tried to soothe him. Then she motioned for me to join them, and we all lay beside each other. To these two, the ruins of this old city spoke of lost glory and family and happiness. To me and to the old spirit within, the city spoke of forerunners, deigning to allow us a crude, limited sort of freedom, but only for a time. Had it really been any different back on Erde Tyrene? 